So I um, want to just kind of set the stage a little bit for the session before we dive into it. Um, the purpose of the Deans Forum is really seizing our role as a public university to talk about important ideas um, and to really plant seeds for courageous action, um, particularly around the way that race uh, is embedded in public policies and public institutions. So we have had this series for about the last two and a half years, um, and there have been a range of topics around voting and managing organizations, child welfare, uh, looking at the racial reckoning in Washington state, and all of these are recorded and available to you on our website. Um, but as I said, this particular topic is going to be focused on uh, the climate law. So one of the things we like about this format is that we can bring you high quality content, but then also have a dynamic session where we move back and forth between the insights of the panelists and your live questions. Um, so few things to know, in a minute, uh, the speakers are going to be pinned, so you'll see us more than all of these people on your screen. Um, please bring your, have your video on if you're willing to and mute. Um, but what we're gonna do with the questions, if you have clarifying questions, just put them in the chat. Um, and my team is behind the scenes working and, and grabbing them out and putting them onto a format that I can easily see them. So in the past, we've had really dynamic uh, interactions and we just encourage you to use the technology to enable that today as well. Um, before we do start though, I want to do what we typically do here at the Evans School, which is to acknowledge uh, the Coast Salish people on, the on whose lands we study and work at the University of Washington. Um, their ancestors have re resided here since time immemorial, and they continue to live on the place today, and they're deeply rooted in their cultural traditions. We also want to acknowledge that the country was built from the land theft and geno genocide of other indigenous communities and the enslavement and forced labor of Black people. And while these acknowledgements are a small gesture, um, but in making them, we really want to recognize our responsibility to learn and share the history and build the relationships where we together can create a more just public policy. So um, I'm now going to turn to the topic of our forum. Um, obviously, there's a lot of awareness growing and building about the climate crisis. Um, and as somebody for whom this is not my field, I get a bit overwhelmed sometimes because there's so many potential targets of our attention for mitigation work and for just increasing our own knowledge. So the press is filled with stories and there's a lot of different responses from the local level, advocacy organizations and local governments to the state, regional, national, international, multinational level. Um, so one of the things that's of interest to me is that there's also a lot of policy tools that are being brought agreements and goals, regulations, cap and invest permits, um, tax credits. In August of this year, Congress passed the budget Re reconciliation law as they do every year. Um, and this year it happened to be called the Inflation Reduction Act. And it had a variety of issues in it, like it always does, healthcare, tax changes, et cetera. But the most significant as we'll hear was some groundbreaking elements related to and responding to the climate change problem. In fact, the Environmental Defense Fund called this the largest and most ambitious climate legislation by Congress ever passed. So as somebody who's committed to both understanding these current events and understanding climate change and trying to understand how right, white racial bias is embedded in policies and institutions, I wanted to call the conversation about this new law um, and dig into it a little bit differently more deeply focused on this issues of race. So I have invited three amazing experts to join us this afternoon. Um, one of them is Ed Shu, who's the Deputy Regional Administrator of the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we also are joined by Charles Lee, who's the Senior Policy Advisor for Environmental Justice in the U U.S. EPA. And then also Allison Cullen, who is our Evans School uh, Daniel J. Evans professor, and also very involved in the EPA as the chair of their scientific advisory board that really provides scientific evidence to the EPA administration. So I want to have them each introduce themselves um, and really wanted to say, ask, have you talk a little bit about 
who you are and what parts of your experience are relevant to this conversation we want to have about this new act um, and its racial uh, implications. Who would like to go first? You're not a quiet group, so I'm surprised there's no <laughs> people jumping in. <laughs> Uh, I will defer to Charles. Uh, this okay. is a well, major topic of conversation, and he's our in-house expert on environmental justice issues. Well, uh, thank you, Jody, and thank you, Ed, um, uh, and uh, well, and thank you, everyone, for um, giving me the opportunity to uh, be part of this conversation. Uh, I was, I've been really looking forward to it. I guess um, just to say who I am quickly, um, um, I am currently the Senior Policy Advisor for Environmental Justice in the newly formed National Program Office at uh, EPA on um, Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. And I'll explain later uh, what the significance of that is. But I guess my uh, real claim to fame, um, as Ed kind of alluded to, was I was one of the persons that helped give birth to the environmental justice um, uh, issue and environmental the movement in the U.S. Um, and um, going back to the 1980s. Um, and um, I've um, worked in many different capacities um, uh, uh, from the very beginning uh, when uh, the protests um, around um, uh, a uh, sighting of a hazardous waste landfill in a um, in Warren County, North Carolina, uh, to the original research and a lot of the policy work that um, um, kind of established the framework or the uh, for um, addressing environmental justice in the federal and later in state government. So um, I guess that a lot of that and mainly. Um, uh, I'm going to go into detail about that later, but all this is um, our, I guess, building blocks. Towards, Can you hand um, me the pistachios, please? Towards yeah. this conversation uh, today in terms of what the real significance um, of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and other uh, similar measures that are taking place with the federal government now around environmental justice and civil rights. And um, I just close by saying that uh, I guess I bring context to why, um, you know, the impact of the Infl Inflation Reduction Act uh, is going to have, uh, is going to be gener generational in nature. Ed, Allison, what expertise do you bring to our conversation? Go ahead, Ed. Oh, no, Allison, I, I will defer to you as well. I'll uh, go back. Uh, all right. Well, delighted to be on a panel with the two of you, um, Ed and Charles. Uh, so I'm Allison Cullen. I recognize so many of the people on the screen as students and former students and colleagues and former colleagues. Um, so my background is in decision making. I have a civil environmental engineering background and also in public health. And when I think about decision making, I'm always thinking about what information do we use to decide among alternatives, among different things we could do? And what information is compelling? What might change someone's mind or change the course of history or change how an act is implemented? So, you know, for my part of this, I'll be thinking about the act as a, as a seed. And there's so much ahead in terms of making decisions about how it will be implemented and what will happen. And that's right up my alley for thinking about. Um, I am still learning about the act. I think a lot of people probably who are joining us today are still trying to learn about it. It has all kinds of provisions and there are a lot of things that aren't defined yet. And so, you know, we bring both objective and subjective information to that. We have, you know, things that we measure and model, but then we also have cases and experiences and more traditional knowledge and different ways of knowing. And we need to bring all that together somehow to help us make those decisions to make the act a reality. It holds a lot of promise, but um, you know, like anything, like the devil's in the details and in the implementation. So I'll leave it there for right now, but um delighted to be here and to represent the Evans School faculty and to join you two on the panel. And and uh, thank you, Jody, for inviting me to join the panel because I clearly I defer to 
uh, our experts on both on the science as well as on environmental justice. You can see that we have really uh, just fantastic experts on this panel. My uh, role, I, the contribution here is that I have been with EPA for uh, now over 30 years. And I think Charles, we met in the 90s. I think that's when, right. and, <laughs> when Charles came to EPA to start the environmental justice program. And uh, at that time, I actually uh, helped start the children's health program at EPA. So we had a, a, a different path. And I know that Allison had some um, uh, stake in that as well in her early career as well. So I think we have a, a connection. All three of us have a connection back uh, way back, uh, decades going back. Uh, my interest and, and the reason that I'm so delighted to be here is that I think we're really at a very, very uh, uh, important period in environmental protection and uh, what the administration and, and the Congress has done, uh, particularly with the topic that we'll be discussing today, is just absolutely un unprecedented in my uh, public service career. And I think many of us who are on this call uh, and so I think um, how uh, we implement some of the directions and the priorities that are coming out of Congress and the administration is going to be extremely important uh, in terms of how we uh, uh, correct the wrongs of the past, as well as figuring out how we build a future for, uh, in terms of uh, for equity reasons for everyone. And so um, the topic that I hope that I'll be able to talk about a bit today, and one role that I have at EPA, other than my daytime job, uh, is that I also serve as the uh, uh, designated federal officer for the Environmental Financial Advisory Board, which has taken on and just provided the EPA administrator with a, a very important set of uh, recommendations about how to implement um, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So. Uh, I, I hope that I'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that as well. But it really, because everything that we do on the IRA, I think, has a clear, clear and direct interface with the issue of environmental justice and equity concerns, and particularly with, when it comes to low income and uh, disadvantaged communities. So I'm really delighted to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Great. So what I'd like to do is to just um, introduce some terminology. So um, this Inflation Reduction Act has a lot of things in it, as I said. Um, and as Allison suggested, there are multiple people involved in implementing this thing. So you've got multiple federal agencies, you've got state action, local action, community nonprofits, and part of what I wondered was, um, is this a new opportunity to think about achieving racial equity and how we make investments in the environmental policy area? And so um, I just kind of want to provide everybody who's joined us today um, just a high level summary of what, what is in this law, because it is 369 billion B, right? A lot of money. Um, that's focused on energy security and climate change responses, and really focused on these desired outcomes, which is lowering energy costs, include increasing cleaner production, and this ambitious goal of uh, reducing carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. There are lots of ways to group the provisions of the law, but one of them is there's a set of things connected to energy costs and really creating jobs for clean energy markets with tax credits, solar and wind rebates, et cetera. There's another group of things that is focused on reducing pollution. So as Ed just talked about the greenhouse gas um, parts of this law and potentially that has 10 times more climate impact I have learned than any other single piece of legislation. Um, and then there's also a group of things around building a new economy um, that's really highlighting clean energy. Um, and this is things around products uh, like panels and turbines. Um, it's also in some things to change food production, coastal resilience. And I think significant for our conversation today is this is a, a very ambitious investment, um, $60 billion in communities that have really borne the brunt of pollution to really advance racial justice. 
And so to start us off, um, I wanted to exploit the fact that Charles is on our panel um, and really help us understand this act in historical context, um, particularly around environmental justice. Um, you know, where did this idea of environmental justice um, come from? Um, and um, where did it begin? Because you were there. So help us all understand a little bit more of that context. Yeah, th thank you, Jody. And so um, I guess, um, you know, the, uh, people think of environmental justice uh, as um, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement in the development and implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, uh, regulations, and policies. So that's the standard kind of formal uh, EPA governmental definition. But there's a lot that goes on in there. Uh, that has to do with like values and assumptions um, and the core issue of uh, why, uh, how and why uh, certain populations, um, uh, mainly communities of color, low income communities and, and tribal indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by environmental burdens and um, I would say lack of environmental benefits. Um, and, uh, and so, in the in in the and these issues have gone on for hundreds of years um but uh the environmental justice movement and the environmental justice issues as it's shaped uh, by that movement um in in the modern era uh uh starts i would say in the 1980s when like i said before an incident in north carolina in, in warren county a poor black uh, rural county was uh, cited for a hazardous waste landfill and 500 people. Um, uh, there was a campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience and 500 persons were arrested. I um, had the, um, I guess, privilege to be there. And, you know, from a personal perspective, um, that's what drove people asked me. So why did you get involved in this issue of environmental justice? And I think, um, you know, it was there I saw the um, transformative potential of the nexus between the issues of race, poverty, and environmental uh, quality. Um, and note at, at that point, and that, you know, when we started working on this issue, the issue, the, the term environmental justice did not exist. Um, and so, um, you know, that led me to, um, go work for um, the Civil Rights Agency of the United Church of Christ, where I worked there for almost two decades. And we did a, a lot of the groundbreaking kind of uh, foundational work in kind of laying this issue. I uh, saw it as trying to put this issue, um, uh, uh, bring this issue to national attention, to put it on the map. Um, and, you know, after... Um, uh, you know, one of the first things or that I did was to try to uh, bring uh, the power of information of empirical evidence to bear. Uh, and that led to um, the uh, first national uh, study on the demographics related to hazardous waste sites, which is that um, 1987 report, Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. Um, you know, that... Um, uh, led to, uh, I think, a, you know, an incredible amount of energy and attention on the part of researchers and academics uh, to the point now where uh, I think you could say that there are now thousands of peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journal articles in all different areas from, um, you know, uh, health, uh, from uh, uh, environment, uh, from uh, in public policy, in the law, in planning, et cetera, on, uh, you know, on the subject. Um, one of the things I saw coming out of that um, report uh, and the kind of attention this issue got among uh, communities who, um, you know, after the toxic waste and race um, uh, uh, was uh, published, uh, I, I got all these uh, phone calls from different communities uh, who were 
kind of trying to deal with this issue of the fact that you know they had um some kind of environmental problem uh in their uh, in their community and they didn't they, they didn't connect it with race you know that they, they didn't they, it was something that i think people kind of had a sense of but there was no way people were not able to articulate it in the in the context of race um and so i got all these phone calls that you know that you know uh, spoke to that um and um and i realized uh having gone around the country um and to all different types of communities that there was actually quite a lot of work being done on environmental issues in people of color low income and tribal communities and so i thought you know, it was an opportunity to uh, um, to coalesce a movement around this nationally, and that's what led to the uh, 1991 uh, first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit uh, that brought uh, nearly a thousand people to Washington D.C. Um, codified a set of um, uh, environment uh, principles of environmental justice. Uh, it had a call for action to go out and build capacity at the communities and build networks that support each other. Uh, and, you know, and I think growing out of that over the past, I guess now 30, some more than 30 years, uh, there's been incredible work going on in the communities. And um, it has gone to, uh, you know, the degree of sophistication where there are uh, really impacting uh, public policy on various levels, and we can go into that. And I think one of the there is a direct connection between many of the people that were part of that summit process and and um, you know the advocacy that led to the Biden administration making um, environmental justice kind of the centerpiece or, or centerpiece of their uh, of their agenda. Um, uh, and then lastly, I would just say that, you know, another kind of thread that runs through this is uh, the um, uh, is a, a, a public policy and governmental actions uh, to uh, beginning with the establishment of EPA's Office of Environmental Equity uh, at that time, the first executive order on environmental justice. Um, and um you know uh on various levels of government uh statutes and uh regulations and programs in in virtually every state now across the country in the district of columbia puerto rico uh guam um uh you know, the um uh, the virgin islands etc you know so that um um uh, and um and and this has i think uh really kind of culminated now uh in all the things that are happening uh, in at the federal level uh, in terms of uh, environmental justice, I said before I would want to talk about the um, significance of the idea of having a national program at EPA around um, environmental justice and, and external civil rights. Um, this is part of EPA's efforts to move uh, environmental justice and equity to the very center of this mission. So. A uh, way to think about that would be, um, you know, EPA has uh, heretofore abided by uh, like three principles, science, law, and transparency. And now there's a fourth prin principle, justice and equity. And so, I mean, that is really a sea change that, um, you know, um, and the idea of not just having a little boutique office, but making it a national program, just like many of the media programs like air water um and um and uh, land, uh toxics and land um is you know so that's um kind of a i i i'm sorry if i'm going on a little bit but that's the you know trying to capture all this history so i said before um that um i thought the uh inflation reduction act and many of the other um you know uh, laws that uh, have come forward in the last several years have a generational impact. And it re we really are in, uh, I gave a talk the other day about, you know, what what all this means. And um, and I thought that, you know, uh, and I had the title, uh, one of the, I had in the title that we are now in an era of transformative change for environmental justice and civil rights. Um, so, you know, the fact that there are, 
so, so you know, I was asked this, a Washington Post reporter asked me several years ago, um, so you have all this evidence now of environmental injustice. How do you actually solve the problem? You know, I mean, that's the harder question. Right? And I tell them that's a really hard question to, to answer, right? And um, and I think we're beginning to see some of the contours of what that what the answer to that is. And you know, and first of the, this whole notion of um you know, how do you uh, uh, solve the issues of environmental injustice, particularly uh, the underlying issues of structural racism, um, you know, that have, that leads to concentrated environmental burden and lack of benefits um, in certain communities. Uh, you know, the first thing is, you know, the kind of focused attention and resources uh, in historically underserved, uh, uh, underinvested or disinvested communities, um, you know the, the the fact that billions of dollars are being devoted to this uh, issue, um, it becomes it, in of itself an engine for transformative change. And Ed alluded to it, in you know, with some examples, so we're going to see this kind of play out over the next. Um, 10, 20 years in terms of what this all means. Uh, part of the history that leads to this is the idea, uh, one of the big issues that in environmental justice advocates have worked on was actually tools to identify places where you could um, you know, do, uh, pay, uh, prior, prioritize uh, the allocation of resources of scale. Um, and uh, this uh, be began in California, um, you know, around uh, the greenhouse gas reduction fund, but you know this has been taken and it has taken place in other states. It's now been taken to uh, scale. I think in what um president in President Biden's Justice Forty initiative, which um uh, uh dedicates forty percent of uh, the benefits uh, of um, certain programs will flow to uh, to um, disadvantaged or underserved vulnerable communities. The second thing that um, just kind of point out in terms of like what this all what this generational impact and I had a hard time trying to pull all this together but I think all that all this means is that um, you know we have to think about new governance approaches. Uh, and this includes partnerships uh, at all levels of government, uh, horizontally and vertically. It involves um, a central role for communities in determining um, the future, uh, the destiny of their own communities. Um, um, uh, and um, it involves work on all different levels in, in universities and in, in philanthropy, et cetera that um, could to help support this. And then lastly, um, when we um, when uh, we sent our report uh, in 1987 to, uh, to EPA, the uh, response we got back was that EPA deals with issues of technology and not sociology. And, you know, and this whole notion that, that there is a distributional impact, uh, that, that environmental I issues are affecting people differently, um, you know, uh, uh, because of certain factors like race or income, um, is something that is really foreign to the way we go about doing environmental protection. And this is an opportunity to really address a whole host of interrelated issues that have to do with disproportionate, cumulative, um, and distributional impacts. And in, in in the heart of that is a, is now you know I think um, a moving properly moving the role of civil rights to the center of what we do. So I just want to stop there um, and and um, kind of paint that picture in terms of what all this means. Can I ask a clarifying question to Charles or Ed? So from what you've just said so is this new investment of 60 billion the first time when there has been a a large epa it sounds like it's going to create an office is that right well is we had an office before but now okay. we're going to make it a national program got it okay so that's a, that's a, that's the change right in other 
agencies were maybe not as far, far along as EPA, you know, one of the many executives called for establishment of new offices of environmental justice. Like at the Department of Justice, there's now a new office of, of environmental justice. But the at EPA, we move to the next level, which is to create a program similar to the Office of Air or the Office of Research and Development, the Office of Enforcement. Can I follow that just really quickly? So, you know, it's really interesting to try to bring these two things together, uh, environmental justice and, say, climate, addressing climate impacts, because of what Jody just said in Charles' answer, because the scale, you know, justice happens at a very disaggregated scale, community mm -hmm. by community, family by family. Um, and if we have data that are all sort of aggregated and averaged across large spaces and times like you do for climate and thinking about climate impacts, that makes a really kind of uneasy uh, combination. And so it's it's a really interesting challenge to be able to do this, um, to think both at that small scale and at that large scale at the same time, where climate across decades and centuries and the whole planet, and then thinking very locally and very specifically about people and families in specific places and times. I don't want to put too fine an edge on it, but I, I, like, I really like what you just said, Charles. It's really interesting, Jordi. I just want to comment on this as well, is that uh, it's interesting to talk about climate and EJ in mm -hmm. parallel in terms of the history that Charles just told. Um, and also, Allison is probably, you could probably agree about the history of science that, that also Charles talks about studies and research that went into EJ parallel on the climate side. And what's transformative under this administration is that now there is a switch where real investments are being made both fronts. So the question that keeps coming up that Charles, we've had always had difficulty answering on both fronts is what are the actions? How are you gonna actually institutionalize this in our institutions to be able to make a difference on the EJ issue, equity issues, as well as on the climate issue. And that's, for me, as I observed this throughout my career and where we are now, that's what Charles is talking about. Some things that we're, we're gonna talk about today, as well as what he mentioned in terms of creation of an office, right? That's a bureaucracy uh, issue uh, for, as Jody, you're perfectly reasonable to ask the question, well, how does that make a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. But for EPA and the federal agencies, it's a big deal, mm -hmm. huge deal for us to be. And, and what Charles just mentioned, we're still working through that because uh, uh, the president and Congress created this office in DC, but right now in, within the agency, we're still trying mm -hmm. to figure out how do we do this across the country, across the regional offices and so on. Now, these are sort of things that happens within the federal bureaucracy. And you can see how important it is to Charles because he understands, and as I do, and I think many of your students, when they get into public service will understand is that the institutions and the actions and the things that we put in place legally will have an impact on making a difference. But I think until this point, until this point, uh, with the you know bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act and the whole host of the executive orders that the president put out his first I think 90 days. In fact, I think EJ for, uh, the Justice 40 initiative. I think Charles was one of the first uh, executive order that the president put out. And uh, these are really now getting at the actions. That's one of the reasons that I, I've been so. Um, interested in how the policies themselves now will institutionalize the work that we need to do going forward. It's no longer about research, no longer, I mean, we're going to have to continue to do them, but it's not changing people's uh, hearts and minds. I hope that's still not the case on climate or EJ. And I think that's what Charles was talking about. And that's what I take away from the history on this. Uh, and just one, just for those of us who are older, just kind of thinking about what the transformative moments uh, are and, uh, and how we should look back on this uh, 20 years from now is, you know, we think about how the highway, the interstate system, um, the, the Eisenhower presidency and talk about how the infrastructure has really made an impact on um, uh, our lives and in and, and and this country's history and economy and so on. But 
that part of the history, what people forget about is environmental results of that as well. And they, you know, cities like LA and other places with cars and so on. So I think as what I like to think about as we talk about all of this is that how are our actions now in this transformative moment going to be looked upon 20 years from now? And what do we build today that when we look back 20 years from now and say, hey, we really had a huge difference, made a difference. And I think you know, uh, are we going to achieve the 40% reduction by 2030? That's not 20 years from now. That's coming up right now on greenhouse gases. And same thing on the equity issues. Are we able to um, uh, uh, bring some level of satisfaction in terms of making sure the communities that are uh, low income and disadvantaged are uh, taken care of in this transformative moment. I think that's really important for all of us who are getting into public service and public policy to think about. You know, one of the, um, you know, one of the things that really intrigued me about all this, and this to, is to build off of Ed's point about the uh, uh, environmental justice and climate, is in California. There's a uh, um, so there's a program called a, a transformative climate communities pro program, you know, and I think um, the, it, uh, so that's very much community driven collaborative efforts in certain cities to address certain climate issues. It's cross, you know, it's across all agencies, but it shows that, well, we have to start thinking about what this all means. It, it's just not like having a set of resources uh, top down, which is very important and essential, but it also has to be a bottom up process and they have to meet and kind of get integrated together. And that's really uh, challenging, but I think that's where the potential and the um, opportunity and the excitement could be. Well, and that's in fact why I wanted to call the conversation, because on the one hand, if you have people saying nationally that this is this transformational investment. We've never had this kind of investment before on climate. And there is increased urgency in the public imagination about this. Some would argue 20 or 30 years too late. Mm -hmm. And you have, as you're both all saying, that there is this environmental justice kind of parallel, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that in each of these provisions, there's opportunities to do what Allison is doing, which is which Allison suggested, which is to try to activate the implementation people at various levels and the micro decisions that people are making and the different uh, entities of governments, tribal governments, county governments, state governments to take advantage of and ask questions about environmental justice, even though that might not be the topic they're supposed to focus on, right? And so what I was hoping we might do is to kind of walk through the provisions of this law, again, at this high level to say, if you're interested and committed to environmental justice and thinking the way racial bias is implicit in policy, unless we do something about it, right? So part of this is saying we've got to be active to not just default to the way things have been because that gets us in equitable outcomes. Um, what are the kinds of questions that you would want people who are working at different parts in this system to really think about? So I'm gonna put back up my slide and um, just have you all kind of riff off of the first series of things um, that are, are really focused on energy costs. Because when I look at that, I think, huh, how would you bring an EJ, an environmental justice lens to getting people access to clean energy at the household level. How do you think about that? I could kick it off with a, just some, you know, early, early ones. Um, you know, so this is about households, in some cases, homeowners, in some cases, certain kinds of housing are being targeted in the act. Um, and then consumer rebates, you know, for folks who are buying things. So we need to think about, who are those people? Who owns homes? What kind of homes do various people live in? What kinds of home environments are they being exposed to? How much control do individuals have over the kinds of appliances and the kinds of energy systems their homes have? So if we think about 
middle and upper income people who are owning homes, if we think about lower income people who are owning homes, just thinking about that distribution that Ed pointed out early on, you know, these are distributed um, home ownership is distributed. How folks are buying um, appliances and other devices is distributed. Um, and, and that's an interesting part of this, right? And so how do you ensure, as you think about equity and justice, how do you ensure that you're reaching people who are disproportionately burdened um, through all of those margins? That's just a quick one to kick it off. Yeah, and, and and one thing that I can add is, as we were, uh, our the Environmental Financial Advisory Board members were discussing about this precise issue of uh, uh, distributing the funds, uh, and may, they talked many, uh, they discussed many issues, but the, at the core of it for uh, low income and disadvantaged communities is that oh, there is not uh, financial help right now. Uh, the private market has not been able to uh, bring a lot of capital to lower energy costs or other environmental concerns that uh, the communities are facing. So um, the, I think that it's going to be really critical for EPA and other agencies to really take account of the differences where people are today. So, for instance, you know, are, are uh, the indebtedness of certain communities. Right. I mean, the availability of money to even invest themselves into projects or to um, uh, the ability to even try to get a loan to do things that uh, many of the uh, uh, tax uh, uh, breaks that are trying to target. Do, do, how do we account for those types of um, uh, dis differences? And also the other issue that comes up uh, frequently, uh, particularly when we talk about distributed energy, uh, production and subsidizing those uh, types of activities, home ownership. I mean, what about the uh, 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 areas where there's a, not a lot of home ownership and how do we design programs so that we could get the benefits also to those communities? So I think there, are, so the idea of lowering energy costs as a broad policy makes a great deal of sense. But in terms of, as Charles said, it's, it's about the specific design of the policies and to take account of the target population here and the Justice 40 and even under the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, 40% of the uh, uh, money uh, is Congress and the president has already dedicated. So the question is, how do we get it to them in a way that uh, allows us to both get greenhouse gas reductions and uh, be able to address some of these already inequities, inequities that already has some uh, a barrier in having those communities participate in these programs. So I think the program design part of it is going to be extremely important. As a scholar of implementation, what I'm trying to understand is this energy stuff, most of the tools that people that are in the provisions of the law are really about trying to make the markets create different products, right? More efficient products. Is that correct? So you have to be able to purchase the products, right? <laughs> That's Allison's well, point. And, and, and what, I, what I can talk about is with the uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund, basically the idea. Let's that's, that's, that's wait. Let's okay. wait for that. I want, cause that's really in the second bucket of pollution. I think I just want to understand this energy cost part and what's the EJ part of that. I mean, you it could. It is somewhat related. I mean, in that it, the idea here is that uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases, the way to get to that is for us to invest in zero emissions technologies, but it's also on clean energy aspect of it. That's the only reason I mentioned. It. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. No, I thought that was. I thought that was right on the money. And I mean, if you think about electric vehicles, right, providing that infrastructure for charging and coming up with with technologies, and even thinking about how to support people who maybe are going to get into the used EV market. You know, the new EV market is a pricey market, and mm -hmm. you know, offering rebates is great, but who is buying those cars? And so, thinking about some of those additional things that can be done, which actually the Biden administration has been doing, thinking about. The used market um, and other sorts of things. You know, Ed, you'll be tickled because I was looking at the notes from the um, it's the Environmental Financial uh, Advisory Board public meeting from October. I think you're a leader on that. 
And some of the questions that were posed there, including, you know, so once you try to do some of these things in terms of providing incentives, opening markets, doing other things, you know, how do you then ensure that there's accountability toward, you know, have we achieved our aims? Have we actually reached the low income and disadvantaged communities that are explicitly mentioned in the um, Inflation Reduction Act? Um, so I, I love I love the set of questions. You probably put that together and thought, who's going to read this? I'll tell you, I read this. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. I'm thankful that someone's paying attention, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> Um, one of the questions from the panel or from the audience is to on this particular lower energy cost bucket, what about renters? Um, are there strategies that implementers could take to try to reach renters who are disproportionately low income um, and people of color? Some of the provisions are targeting folks who um, are our landlords and own homes that are then shared or rented. So the, you know, there are some provisions like that as well. There's so many details, Jody. I mean, seriously, it's hundreds of pages. So I'll I'll, I'll leave it there for the minute. And I, and just to just to add, I again, this is a little tangential, but you you know, the, uh, when you just mentioned the uh, renters, um, one of the key questions that keeps coming up, and maybe Charles will have some uh, in, intervention on this, but um, how do you define low income and disadvantaged community? How do you define that in Seattle? How do you define that in Spokane? How do you, what, what do, uh, you know, I, I, my organization is based in the Midwest in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. okay. What we possibly will define uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities for the purposes of government programs like this um, is pretty expansive. And they may be very different than Newark, New Jersey. And I think Charles, uh, <laughs> I know this has been an issue that's come mm -hmm. up, but it, it, it's no longer a theoretical discussion because it really uh, has an impact on who could actually receive money and who we're going to help. And I think that's where I think Jody, your question is right on because when you say renters, there's some assumption in your statement about, okay, there's a, a part of that segment of that population must be in low income and disadvantaged community. Uh, and so that's the part that I think is something that we're still working through. And may, there are many people who are thinking about this, but you know, we live in a country uh, where we are a very, very diverse uh, uh, country. And so one of the things that the, at least the financial advisory board is, they came up with a set of guiding principles, but they did not want to make any recommendations about how we should do that. So that's something that also is up, up, up for discussion as well. Well, and what's interesting about that to me is that we clearly have metrics that we use nationally for social programs, the federal poverty level, but it, it was based on an inflation adjusted um, measure that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it was based on assumptions from the 1950s about um, the way that people spend their money and it's highly um, skewed towards old ways of consumption. Um, so the states have developed other ways, but it's not embedded in national policy in the same way. So I'd love to add just one thing to that. Again, appreciating Ed's comment, um, you know, for different provisions in the act, the act does not define disadvantaged communities overall, as Ed, as Ed pointed out. Mm -hmm. And for different aspects of the act, they're actually kind of going down different roads. So if it's, you know, if it's a tax credit, okay, well, who pays tax and how much tax do they pay? And you need to have taxes that you're paying that you could get credit against. If you don't pay enough tax to benefit from the amount of the credit that would come back your way, um, you know, that's something to, to consider. And also um, income thresholds around the rebates and the um, credits for purchasing EVs, for example, you know, phasing those out at higher incomes, things like that. So you, although it's always the conversation, right? Who is eligible for the program? What are we considering to be our target communities and so forth? It's interesting on this one because it seems like there may be some different ways of doing it for the different provisions. And Ed, you're on that finance board, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm reading in it is a lot of it is still actually in that implementation step, which is interesting. 
Yeah, and in fact, it provides opportunities for people who might be on this webinar <laughs> to think about if they're involved in implementing one provision, like what makes sense given where they sit to how to define disadvantage. That's something that if it doesn't get asked, it will default to something that maybe isn't advancing the environmental justice that you that we seek. And and I think that, you, Jody, you're right on with this because a lot of the pr provisions are really market-based provisions, right? I mean, you know, you, you're you talking about uh, uh, tax incentives and you're talking about rebates and you're trying to kind of influence people's buying decisions and investment decisions. And that assumes some level of understanding by the communities as well as uh, ability to participate in that. And I think that's something that the board, uh, the Environmental Financial Advisory Board looked at and said, you know, that perhaps may be something that um, uh, the EPA should look at in making a decision about how to actually implement this. Because uh, if you don't account for the fact that many of the communities uh, may not be participating in a lot of these programs uh, because it's it it's not just about the money, but just uh, the ability to actually even just participate. And and I, I can tell you, and I think Charles and the EJ program is thinking about this, but one of the things that we always hear from our EJ communities and, and tribal communities also as well is that they always say that it's really difficult to get money from the federal government. Just paperwork, just being able to uh, account for fiduciary responsibility, all of the, uh, the kind of the barriers that uh, exist, currently exist, will continue to exist under the IRA and other programs unless we're able to kind of figure out how to deal with those issues. And those are very, very um, out of the box thinking that we need to do now because uh, I think someone also asked a question about uh, our, about Congress uh, switching over in 2023, and I think it's not just because of that, but you know the federal government with this much money on the table, we are going to be under intense scrutiny scrutiny uh, to make sure that the money is spent for the purposes that it's intended, and that we actually get the results that it's intended. Right, so greenhouse gas uh, reduction fund the purpose of it is to reduce greenhouse gases. So the question is, how, you know, are we going to be able to demonstrate that and our communities and the projects that are focused on communities that may not may need some technical support to get the funding and project developments and so on, if they're not ready to do that, we also may not be able to accomplish that objective, which is to get 40% of the funding to these communities that are in need. So I think there's a lot of... Um, structural issues and, and and Charles is right about talk about the history on this because a lot of our communities and tribal governments are at a disadvantage in trying to obtain federal funding. So uh, if you start from there, it, the, the, how we design our future programs and distributing these types of money will matter uh, a great deal. And so when you talk when in this slide, I think um, it's there's a lot behind, um, you know, things like tax credits and rebates that may exclude a segment of the population that we're trying to help at this point. Yeah, one other one on that is just, um, you know, do they have to front the money or do you, do you have to actually lay out all the money and then you get something back? Or can you preemptively support people financially to to do certain things and make certain decisions, certain purchases and so forth. So, and I think, you know, again, Ed's board has, has thought about that as well. So it's really, as you said, the devil is in the details. And just because uh, people have an aspiration, they need to think about the implications for the user um, in how those details of the policy implementation are shaped. One thing before it kind of moves between the higher energy costs and the reducing harmful pollution parts of this law. Um, one of the comments was that that because this is so market based, it's going to likely stimulate manufacturing and mining and potentially processing of minerals, right, for batteries and things like that. And so they're going to there's going to be pollution that comes out of that change in the market. In, and can you imagine how that might have implications for communities of color in particular? And, and you know, is there, again, 
decisions or choices people could make to mitigate that, to have it not be just inevitable? You know, I know that that's an issue that's come up uh, several times, you know, in, in fact, in the exact way that you uh, you uh, you articulated it, Jody. And and, you know, I I think some of the some of these are going to be really challenging issues because they're going to be um, this drive to, um, you know, to uh, have new resources. And a lot of these are, in fact, um, you know, on um, or near native lands, for example, you know, and and so, uh, you know, making sure that uh, uh, that they're involved in the decision making process is going to be a really important piece of this. And I think that's a, there are kind of two facets of that. I think Jody, one is. Um, uh, it creates, again, another barrier for people to participate because, for instance, one of the things that, uh, let's say you want to do, uh, uh, I think there's a, a case like this that we're working on right now, a transmission line to carry renewable wind energy to population centers. And um, the those types of projects are really large-scale projects, right, that, that uh, under NEPA, uh, there's going to be again, a federal regulation that they need to comply with. So large scale projects are gonna be something that they'll be able to, they're equipped to deal with because they're large investments. And even if government funds part of that, uh, I think they could deal with some of these uh, uh, co benefits or uh, other unintended consequences issued like Endangered Species Act and so on. Um, but for smaller communities, the, it's a real challenge because if we design a program where they have to do those types of analyses mm -hmm. and be able to say to the federal government that we are on a net basis, it's gonna be positive in reducing greenhouse gas, they have to demonstrate that. Once again, you know, again, I, this is not a subjective comment, but just the factual issue of it's gonna take a lot of money and effort to be able to meet that and our board members actually discuss that, which is how do you make sure that there are not these um, uh, uh, paperwork barriers, right? now, but it's not paperwork barrier, right? As you point out, there are real concerns about unintended consequences or pollution being created uh, by doing something else. So there's also a lot of folks who are um, already weighing in and saying that maybe you shouldn't you should really balance the small projects versus large projects. Because the larger the project is, we're gonna have bigger greenhouse gas reductions and quicker greenhouse gas reductions, but those will squeeze out a lot of the smaller projects. Um, and then of course, if we say we're gonna promote smaller projects, the, some of the trade-offs that we have to consider is, are we going to uh, reduce the paperwork uh, burden or does that mean that we but don't, they don't try and step? I don't stumble. I show. <laughs> anyway, so I'll stop there. I think it sounds like I was doing... sitting, don't speak like I'm hawking, but just speak behind. Okay, so team, I need you to find the person love, who doesn't have their mute on. Um, so I want to focus a, a second on this greenhouse gas part because this is a major, major goal, right? <laughs> As you were talking about, I mean, the goal is reduce carbon emissions by 40%, like in almost nothing, in 2030. Um, and it's one gigaton, and because I'm not a science person, I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds like a lot, right? Um, so, one of the things that I've learned as I've tried to do my research on this is that part of what's unprecedented is that they want the federal government to move really quickly, right? Because the president has gotten been able to articulate that we are at a crisis on climate change. And so is there more opportunities for advocates in local places, for example, to weigh in or help or provide projects that might be able to help with that big, big goal? Or is it just as you're suggesting here, Ed, like, is it just something that we let the big ones 
that are shovel ready be the response. Because again, there, there's a lot of equity implications in, in how people respond to that. And by the way, I, I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just saying that that is exactly how you're characterizing it. It's a trade-off in the some of the balance that we need to achieve, right? So because the, this is a huge effort to, well, just to give you a, a, a different framing on this one gigaton by 2030 is that even in the greenhouse gas reduction fund provision, it's a brand new program. The money isn't just coming into an existing program in the federal government. So we have no, pro we're, we're developing it right now. And if you think about how much money that is, you know, back of the envelope calculation for, it, we have to spend it by September 30th in 2024. And I think one of our board members calculated start, if we started spending it tomorrow, I think that's $50 million a day. Period. <laughs> so, so the question of how to actually do that and also balance these kinds of policy concerns, that's why I think this is a very relevant discussion because, and that's one of the reasons that the Environmental Financial Advisory Board really worked hard to get their uh, uh, options and recommendations in is that the consideration that uh, uh, the agency is taking account of right now, this is going to be really important because it could make a difference whether or not we achieve the goal of uh, helping low-income disadvantaged communities and or greenhouse gas uh, reductions. There's some balance in how we achieve that uh, quickly. There's a speed and there's also the unprecedented amount of investment, but also goals that uh, may uh, potentially that we need to balance to uh, accommodate both. So it's not clear uh, just because of our starting point uh, that uh, that we can accomplish everything for everyone, essentially, like all public policy problems that we have. I'd love to follow that just for a minute. I, I totally agree. You know, we need those really large projects. Um, and we also have in this act opportunities for communities to apply for grants to do sort of local things. And one of the reasons that's pretty interesting, I mean, they do add up, of course, they're not as influential as Ed points out as the really huge projects, but there's a lot of air pollution that is locally experienced uh, that's associated with those greenhouse gas emissions. So there's, there's other kinds of pollutants that tend to also occur when you have GHGs being released. And so kids in schools, you know, electrification of school buses, all those sorts of things, they they get on both margins, right? They they change the, the greenhouse gas footprint, but they also change some of the local air pollution that's experienced. So, you know, taking the point that we need the really big projects, I really like that the act has in it some of these um, block grants and other kinds of grants that specifically communities can apply for to do some of those things that sort of operate on both um, margins, because it's not just the GHGs that gets released, right? We get a lot of other particulate matter and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so yeah, so just wanted to, to flag that one and appreciate Ed's point about the board and what they've been doing on that. Well, and, and just to add to that, um, Allison, the other uh, issue with that is sort of the question that the board has been grappling with when they were trying to come up with their uh, guidance on this is um, the short term versus long term. And, and uh, one of the challenges, uh, at least the intent that we see because of the tight timeline that's statutory, the, the, what we're reading into that is that they would like us to, Congress would like us to, the agency to reduce greenhouse gases as quickly as possible, right? And so that's also another kind of, if those are the incentives, how do we design then also to make sure that there's a long-term sustainable uh, kind of projects that we can fund at the same time? And again, the board members, when they were exploring this, they saw this as sort of a balance between shovel-ready projects, which tend to be projects that are already on, on the books and they tend to be large, uh, versus ones that we focus on, things like what uh, the projects like Allison pointed out. These are projects that are going to be a long-term uh, transformation of our economy. And those are the types of projects that the communities, uh, you know, as, as a board members were reviewing this, that, that they would be interested in. How do we design a program so that we could be um, 
open to both types of programs with that. And, and we're gonna be under scrutiny about this, right? So that's one of the challenges in uh, the program design here. Yeah, I think what I've learned is there is just this tension between the quick and then these other longer term values like equity that we care about. Um, I wanna flip to the next slide here, which is just this, again, things related to, again, the novice in me says products, um, but then there are these little provisions about food or coastal. And, you know, part of this is just a, a result of a political process, right? At the end, uh, when these big bills pass, there are a lot of things that are integrated. But I guess I'm wondering when you're thinking about, uh, again, the environmental justice, are there opportunities for people um, who are analysts or other things to really focus on making sure that those disparate outcomes aren't lost. We actually you know, I go back. Go ahead, and Charles. Just go. one um, one example. You know that the transformative climate uh, communities uh, uh, program at uh, in California. Um, yeah, the uh, Luskin Center, which is at UCLA, is uh, is uh, is actually doing the evaluation, ongoing evaluation support for the program. You know, and that's just one example of how um, a partnership, um, maybe, you know, um, partnerships between academia and government, you know, and communities um, are, you know, I, I think at the, in, from both perspectives of um, you know, California, uh, the Strategic Growth Council, and um, you see the Luskin Center communities are very much at the heart of that because the model they use, um, which has evolved over many years, uh, looking at EJ, um, uh, how do you evaluate, uh, uh, you know, impacts of EJ efforts uh, has the community at the center of that. Mm -hmm. Charles, can you say something about states too? Because I know that for some folks, they they were looking at the, um, you know, this act and, and sort of how some of the funds would flow through states. And so some communities were sensitive to other types of government programs where funds have flowed through states. For example, uh, the Affordable Care Act, you know, there were some tensions with some states not fully engaging um, the provisions. I, I mean, can you think of ways that the federal government can sort of spur or make sure that the states are the kinds of partners that you just, I love that you mentioned partnership. I think that's really key, but to the extent that, you know, in some cases funds will flow through states, just how to make sure that then it flows through and reaches again, the communities that we are trying to reach the disadvantage and so forth. Is that something that you could say something? Yeah, Cause I love I, that you mentioned I, the partnership. I think we could start, I could give some, uh, give um some uh, views on that i mean i think that's a long conversation you know and um there i mean there's different aspects of it um there's a and i think and ed probably can add a lot more to this than than i can but you know um most of these uh, um, much better many or in fact most federal resources are going to go through states and so in there uh, that's just in, if you're talking about an engine for doing something positive or is an engine for, um, you know, uh, just abiding by the status quo and re resulting in a lot of the inequities that we have come to see. I mean, a good example of that would be state revolving funds, you know, because I remember back um, in the, um, you know, during the Obama years when, um, you know, there was the, the, the bill to help revitalize the economy. Um, and, you know, it was all shovel ready projects. And this, we tried very hard at that point to get some provision around looking at, um, you know, demographics as a important, uh, in, important uh, uh, criteria for states. And I think the answer was, you're too late on this, you know, and there was no time to address something like that, right? And I mean, that as you know, the things that Ed talked about before about short term, long term, and you know, timing, and everything, it all fits into this. But I think that's just one example, you know. I mean, the other side of this, um, is you know, the whole uh, push by EPA to make sure that, um, 
you know, things like, um, you know, uh, disproportionate and cumulative impacts and, you know, are being addressed in, say, permits, uh, in, regu in the regulatory process, um, and, you know, in the kind of um, uh, obligation states have for, um, you know, abiding by the Civil Rights Act. And all that is just a, a, the other side of uh, this that all goes along at the same time. And I think that, you know, we have to uh, think about this as part of a system. You know, I think that trying to try to bite this off one without the other well, is going to be really hard. And it does make it, I think, harder to think about. But I think it's also going to, we're going to uh, lead to a lot of unintended consequences if we don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Allison, I have to say that's a really interesting question and, and a timely for at least the uh, work that I've been doing on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund because it's highlighting the issue of um, how you accomplish your objective in, in terms of public policy wise from it's a federal federalism issue also right but it's for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund it's become much more of a general issue because the act actually envisions that most of our money goes through not a nonprofit or nonprofits, right? But they're like, uh, if you compare that to state revolving funds and so on, the federal government is essentially trying to accomplish these objectives through intermediaries, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some stickiness in, in the intermediary. So the question that the board has been trying to address is, how do you put conditions up front before they receive the money. <laughs> uh, and, and how do we learn from things like the state revolving loan funds and other, pro where, uh, and I think the, the, the board also looked at the ARA money and the previous parts where we have learned lots of lessons about the money actually um, uh, not getting quickly enough, the projects not uh, being conducted appropriately and so on. So, so the, that to me has um, uh, become a, a big issue for us now because the money, there's so much money. If it was small amounts of money, we can actually focus on that. Uh, and also the timing, because the Congress, the Congress is really intending us to do this so quickly that we have to really try to figure out if we give out $27 billion by the end of September, 2024, how are we going to ensure the long-term sustainability, accountability? And I think those are the questions that you kind of, because uh, after that, we EPA as a, as, as a federal agency, well, un unless we figure out a program how to um, um, uh, account for all this in long-term or hold people accountable, uh, it's going to be really tough for us to ensure that our objectives that we're talking about in terms of what uh, the administration and Congress wants on the environmental equity piece and climate piece is accomplished. And this, I think, is a really interesting public policy question because there's so many federal agencies that are probably going to have to deal with these intermediary issues and the state issues. And so uh, the, what the board has been thinking about, I think, would be something that I think the EPA uh, will be looking at as well. I really appreciate your answer, Ed and Charles, because I know it's not easy to talk about this and it's so important. And it also gets to this, you know, justice being this sort of very concentrated in place and time issue and and structure and um, and climate being, you know, the, these longer structures and, and bigger spaces. So, um, yeah, the, how the money flows. You know, there's another piece to this, which I think is uh really important for everyone to think about and you know understand the role it plays and we're just beginning to see this which is the activity that's going on around environmental justice at the state level independent of the federal government right and so part of that has to do with um you know um i mean many i mean going back many ideas that are now centerpieces of the biden administration originated in states you know, and we're kind of uh, uh, tested uh, through years of, of practice in states. But, you know, on, on, so that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, states are beginning to pass um, laws around environmental justice and around environmental justice and the consideration of cumulative impact. So, you know, and and um, and um, and and these call for, you know, the kinds of analysis that would 
uh, address this issue in terms of permits and things of this nature, uh, particularly for overburdened communities. But, you know, I, I read um, the other day, uh, I mean, there's something like 14 states now that have either statutes passed or uh, bills pending uh, that call for consideration of cumulative impacts. That's more than a quarter of the states. So this is no small thing. And I think, you know, we have to think about this in terms of, you know, a lot of the kind of proactive roles that different um, parts of, you, you know, of, of our governance processes can can play uh, in trying to address these underlying, uh, you know, equity, foundational equity issues. I I, I want to bring in a few questions here from the audience, um, because I think um, this is one that was asked early on, and I think it's related to what you were just saying, Charles. When you were talking earlier about the generational impact of this law, um, you know, the, the immediate question that comes up is, yeah, but there's now changes in the House. Um, and if the Republicans win the presidency in 2024, do you think that this impact um, will be at risk or how vulnerable really are these changes? Hmm. Uh, that's a hard question, right? You know, because I don't think that there's anything, I mean, I think, you know, the fact that this, there's a commitment in terms of this amount of spending is going to have a big impact in it itself. It's going to take a while to see it play out. What happens then you know, if something happens, as you were describing, happens, what does it do to that process? It's hard. I, I, I'm not totally sure I can foresee exactly, you know, or predict, you know, how that will start to play out. But there's also a question that's kind of inside baseball, but I think it might be a little bit of a case study. So uh, Charles had referenced the Justice 40. Um, in the executive order. Um, and somebody was talking about that the interim guidelines had been issued by OMB back in the summer of 21. And there was supposed to be additional guidance offered six months ago. And I think this was an example of when federal spending um, was supposed to be directed to environmentally overburdened communities. So is the tension or the challenge around the implementation of Justice 40 a precursor of what's to come, or is it something else? I, I can't comment on the Justice 40, that example that you mentioned, but I think some of the things that the board members and the, the things that we've been talking about, I think the challenges could... I, I, I don't know whether the implication, as you're saying it, is is it sort of the bureaucratic issues that are uh, prohibiting uh, getting the money out quickly, or is it uh, the other thing that the board members were talking about was, are there uh, things that we could do in the communities to help them access the funding and so on? Now, I'm not talking about any of the programs that you might be referring to, but this is a real discussion that people are having is that um, the, the challenge here is that we have a lot of money that we would like to make sure that we accomplish the goals that, that, that Congress and president wants us to accomplish. The question is, how do we, it, it's, I, I don't know, this is a terrible way to do it, but it takes two to tangle, right? I mean, we need folks to be able to uh, have the capability and the uh, way to apply for these grants and have access to them, just as the federal agencies need to have programs and um, uh, plans in place to facilitate that and make it as easy as possible, right? And so there's been a lot of talk about that in general. I mean, that's why I, I don't want to comment on a specific pro 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 program, but even in the uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund context, the board has really been struggling with that. And, and one of the recommendations they uh, came up with is that, they, that we balance how we spend the money. So the way that the greenhouse gas reduction fund is really focused on is leveraging and it's really a financing mechanism, right? Try to get more private capital. But I think they have uh, acknowledged that some, maybe what, the, what EPA needs to do is provide technical assistance grants so that we can assist the, the possible recipients. 
so that they can participate in these programs. And I, I think uh, Charles, uh, environmental justice program is doing the same uh, with right. the monies that they have. So, so I think we, there's a give and take in trying to make this happen. Mm. But I think the big challenge is we are trying to remedy something that's been part of the issue. That some of these these communities have not participated in federal programs. Right. That's one part of the issue. And how do we make sure that we we spend effort, time, and effort and resources to help people participate in programs like this. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot to uh, be said for, uh, to, just to add on to um, what Ed said, I mean, looking at it from a, 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 another perspective, um, there's a project um, uh, that's called, there's a nonprofit, it is, uh, it's called the Justice for the Accelerator Project. And it provides technical assistance, um, you know, to fellow non to community-based organizations in terms of getting them more prepared to access the funding that's coming through in terms of the federal government. I mean, the um, the philanthropic community has stepped up in a big way in terms of the um, support for environmental justice. So the historical context for that. Is, is kind of like a historical context for environmental justice in the in government, which is that, you know, these are boutique programs and get very little funding and, you know, are really bootstrap operations. And the funding for from the philanthropic community to the for environmental justice organizations has been minuscule. That's been a long-term, long-standing issue. But now there's recently infusions of, of, of large amounts of money never seen before. Like, for example, the, the BSOC's um, Earth Justice Fund has uh, dedicated $2 billion to environmental justice. And, you know, significant amounts of money are going to um, different environmental justice organizations who, you know, are to help support other ones. And that concept of like having hubs uh, which is an idea that grew, uh, um, that we here at EPA had uh, over time that we need to establish hubs that can be closer to the communities that can help support them. Um, it's also an idea that emerged through a bunch of academic institutions um, that have, you know, work on environmental justice. And so it's coming together. I mean, part of the solution to the, how do you actually spend um, two to three billion dollars in environmental justice grants is through the use of these technical assistance in, intermediaries. Uh, hopefully that would not just, it's just not a conduit for money, but they will actually provide a lot of the Justice 40 or the kind of accelerator support kind of functions um, that go along with the, you know, really making sure there's equity in this process and building up the capacity of those communities. And I think that's why, uh, Jody, I think the intermediaries discussion is a very important one, how all of our programs are, because there's so much money and so many uh, groups of people that we'd like to participate in these programs. So the idea of trying to be as inclusive as possible, uh, we really need to figure out how. Uh, and the reason that an intermediary, I'll just give you just that this may be getting into too much government weeds, but um, typically on environmental just, justice grants, we, uh, we have two people, uh, two FTEs working on a grant. We have a grant specialist and a project officer because we have to manage the money and the projects. And uh, typically, Charles could tell you that we, we used to give out grants in what, 100,000, 200,000 increments. If we did that with this money, we'd have to probably hire an entire agency full of people to manage that money. So we're struggling trying to figure out in the agencies, not, and that's just the EPA, right? Other agencies are also experiencing this, is that there has to be also an infrastructure on the accountability side. And this is what, you know, sort of our grantees always kind of complain about is that, you know, we have to work with um, uh, on, on these reporting and application requirements and all, the, all these burdens. But the reason that we do that is uh, precisely the, you know, getting back at the original question about this in terms of, uh, I would kind of turn that around and say that in, in, because we are using taxpayer money, there is gonna be scrutiny. Uh, regardless of which Congress it is, and we are going to have to answer questions about how we spent these money. So we have this infrastructure in place, which makes it sticky. 
And I think that's what you're getting at, Jody, in terms of why aren't you moving quickly enough? And, and that's what's really also innovative from a government management perspective right now. Uh, we have never had to deal with this kind of um, uh, situation where timing and the money and the workload has become so overwhelming as well. So I don't mean to complain. That's not a complaint. I just uh, just bringing some reality to the uh, the actual flow of money. Well, we have done what I had hoped we would do in the last hour and a half. We have stirred up a lot of questions because of the complexity of the ambition and the investment here. And really try to, I think, emphasize that environmental justice isn't something that's a one and done. It's infinite numbers of decisions that people are making throughout this implementation system. Um, so I just would give each speaker, you know, uh, 30 seconds to say what specific thing might you really want to make sure that people leave from this complex conversation about the implementation of something that's just begun that they could apply. Um, so maybe I will start with Charles. What's the nugget you want people to leave with? You know, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of like wicked problems in society, you know, and, uh, and the idea that environmental justice equity, particularly in the environmental context, right, is a really wicked problem and has intertwined in it all these historical, uh, here to unappreciated, you know, drivers, structural drivers, and, you know, issues in terms of the, the looming climate crisis, you know, all kind of jumbled together. And so this is, a, you know, an opportunity to address wicked problems. Um, you have to really think out of the box. You have to really think differently. You have to really think about things in terms of systems. Uh, and you have to bring to bear um, a, a set of values and, you know, the the idea of, of agency and accountability, you know, is all part of that whole process that, you know, that's involved here. So, um, you know, for people uh, who really want to make a difference, this is a place to work. <laughs> Allison? Mine's really fast. I always get my students to uh, engage in the public comment process. So due on January 18th, the Office of Air and Radiation at EPA is asking for comment on the Inflation Reduction Act. And they have very specific questions they'd like input on, including uh, how to identify disadvantaged communities and how to um, ensure that folks are, are getting access to the programs. There's... Um, I think it's $20 million is available. And I know that sounds small when we talk about billions, but it's it, that's real money, $20 million mm -hmm. of technical assistance for communities that need technical tools, various kinds of support to actually apply for the money. So I will send the link to um, Jody and, and crew and the, you all can hop on there and either engage in the public comment process yourself with your ideas, because I can see in the chat, you've got lots of ideas um, right. or even better, if you can free up someone else, if you have a friend, if you have access um, to uh, folks who are trying to get into the process, if you can help them have time and bandwidth to do something like this, that's also very valuable. So um, yeah, mine's an action item. Let's go. Ed, any final action steps? Yeah, just the, saying the obvious, I, I think I'm just excited and delighted that um, uh, after spending decades in the federal government that I'm experiencing this. It is really transformative. And by definition, transformation means that we need to think out of the box and we really need to have uh, uh, people's participation, as Allison points out. So I will plug the agency. We're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a captive audience here today that uh, if you're interested, you could, I urge you to continue to participate, whether you're in advocacy or you're going to the legal field or in foundations or NGOs and, and so on. But I, I do think that uh, people should get into federal service. I, uh, I had a great pleasure of being in the federal government for uh, three decades. And I know that Allison has worked with federal employees and it, particularly EPA employees. And uh, I, I would urge people to consider uh, coming into public service. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, we are going to send this recording and resources that you have mentioned and that people have put um, in the chat uh, to all of the people
people who have been joining us online. It's not the same as being in person, but it allows us to have conversations with a national audience. So thank you very much. Um, and we will help people get at trying to implement this big, massive thing in a new way outside of the box, because that's part of our role. So thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. Thank, thank you for you making for the panel. Thank you, everyone. Yes, great. <laughs>